Hello, Dream Lunch, and welcome back to our lunch series. This week, we have a very important topic, and as it relates to COVID, we want to be talking about how COVID will impact the now higher education and the future of higher education. We actually have a great panel on for you today, moderated by our own partner, Dr. Demetrius Richmond. So without any further ado, I am going to turn it over to Demetrius and let him introduce his panel. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to have this conversation with some amazing practitioners, scholars, and people in the field of higher ed. We have a lot we want to cover, so I want to just kind of go around and have everybody introduce themselves. Very quickly, tell us your name, tell us your role and responsibilities, um, and, you know, anything else you want us to know about your connection to higher ed. We will start. Well, hello. Uh, nice to be here today. I have uh, come up through enrollment management and student affairs, served the last five years as the chancellor at the University of Michigan Flint, and will start teaching uh, as a professor in the fall. Um, I love what I'm doing because I want to see students successful. And I, you know, you guys all on here are part of the rush of bringing new knowledge and new lenses. And I've always uh, appreciated that. Certainly, certainly. Thank you all for uh, having me on uh, with this amazing panel today. My name is Eric Stokes. I am uh, the Director of Admissions and Orientation at the University of Memphis. I've been in the field since uh, 2004. I started my career at the University of Tennessee with some of these gentlemen here, Demetrius and, and Dr. Bates. Uh, spent several years there, uh, about 14 years there before moving out to the University of Memphis. Uh, and uh, I just love what I do. I love working with young people, uh, college students, particularly high school students, and trying to get them uh, prepared for uh, opportunities in college. Uh, I am Dr. Rob Moore. I actually had a little bit of an interesting journey. So I spent, I guess it was nine years as a lead instructional designer at UNC Chapel Hill at the School of Government. Um, and then while working there, um, I decided that I wanted to get into higher ed and kind of shift from the other side and uh, join the dark side and become a faculty member. So I went to NC State, did my PhD. So my PhD is in instructional design and technology. So I'm currently an assistant professor at Old Dominion University. Um, so I've kind of been on both sides. Uh, it's, it's been nice. I was already teaching online but it was really nice um, not to have all the weight of moving everyone else online. I actually just got to focus on my teaching. Um, I've talked to my colleagues back at Chapel Hill and they're going frantic. And I, as a lead instruction designer, I would have been overwhelmed. So it's, it's nice to be on the other side of things. Greetings and salutations, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on today's call. Uh, shout out to Dr. Stokes and Dr. Richmond. Go back to the days of Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> I came up originally, uh, I am that true traditional path on the student affairs side, uh, coming up all the way from an entry level hall director all the way up to a vice president of enrollment management and student affairs. Uh, I currently serve as assistant vice chancellor for special projects and interim executive director for career services at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I have years of experience working in fundraising because I did fundraising as well, multicultural, DEI work. Um, I've had my hands in just about everything and I've worked at all types of institutions, mostly state institutions like the University of Tennessee, University of Louisville, Bowling Green State University, and of course right now at UNC Chapel Hill. Hi everyone, I'm Yurisanya Flunder and I serve as the Executive Director for Student Life at Odessa College. Um, I have uh, come to the ranks of student affairs uh, started my official career in student affairs at University of Arkansas as well with Dr. Borrego, Dean Kadish. Um, Kadish, I believe, is one of our students at that time. Um, so I'm feeling a little old too. <laughs> um, so uh, I work at a community college, and so I've had experience in public, private, four year, two year um, institutions, mostly on the student affairs side, um, specifically programming, dean of students' office, things like that. So um, Currently, again, um, my position is more associated like a dean of students position, um, but it is executive director for student life. And so we um, house students, we do all of the not um, outside of the classroom type events and activities and uh, resources and programs. So. 
Thank you. Glad to be My name is Kadish Franklin. I actually serve as the Director of Research Advisory Services at EAB. It just stands for Education Advisory Board. Several of your institutions who are on the phone today are actually members of EAB, so thanks for joining us. We'll talk some more about our work together. But I actually started my career, like most of the folks on the phone, in student affairs. I started my first job in student affairs, I called the mullet. I was responsible for fraternity and sorority life and student conduct at Florida State. So I had the business in the front with student conduct, then the party in the back with fraternities and sororities, and I spanned the kind of gamut in higher ed. Spent most of my time thinking about policy work and large scale decision making in higher education. Before I came to EAB, I actually led a think tank thinking about low income first generation students in the United States. So excited for the conversation about COVID. I talk about COVID all day, every day with presidents and their boards of trustees and their cabinet. So lots to say there. So at Dream Launch, we've been very intentional about just having a conversation about how COVID has impacted our reality in America. So we've had discussions with small business owners about its impact. We've had discussions with healthcare professionals and leadership. Uh, last week, we had a discussion with some psychiatrists to look at how is this impacting our mental health. And so we wanted to also really take some time to look at how is this impacting um, the, the field, this, the realm of higher ed, which is why we're calling this discussion, uh, COVID and higher education impact infrastructure and implications. And I believe I heard uh, Kadish Franklin mention that the healthcare sector was about 20% of our economy and it's taken a major hit. And it made me think about how big higher ed is in our reality. And so we wanted to at least um, have a conversation about how is this impacting us within higher ed, whether it's faculty, staff, leadership, uh, parents, prospective students. Um, when we, and, and as we think about who higher ed touches, if, the, if you all had to guess, just for our audience watching, um, how many students are in higher ed as of today? If you had to guess. I'll take a guess, Demetrius. Okay. I would say anywhere probably around over three million, three to four million people. Okay. So we're talking about currently enrolled students at all levels, at all institutions. <laughs> yeah, because I know in the HBCU space, it's around 300,000, so. I, okay. it, it's uh, probably about 20 million. Ding, 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 yes. I didn't I answer because I track the stat every year, so I thought it would be unfair, but when you said 3 million, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I looked it up. It's about 20 million looking That's at right. students alone in the country. Uh, I looked up faculty and staff also who are working within the, the sector, about 3.5 million. So we're looking at over 20 million people who have been impacted by this in higher ed. So that really just kind of gives us um, the motivation and the rationale for us to have this discussion. Um, I want to start off with a quote, and I want some, some, some of the panelists to respond to this. I was reading an article today that was entitled, A Panel Explores What Higher Education Could Look Like in a Post-Corona World. Um, and the quote stood out to me, and I just wanted to kind of let this kind of center our discussion. And it says, the coronavirus has changed the way we learn almost overnight. If this pandemic has proven anything, it's that we as a society can change. Things that were impossible are now possible. And although it feels like the world is collapsing around us, we owe it to our children and our grandchildren to change what we know isn't working. And so I wanted to kind of start that out with the panelists to talk about, as we think about the sector of higher ed, the history of higher ed, how oftentimes higher ed may be a little slow to stay a progressive in some areas. Um, how does that quote really speak to the, the, the field of higher ed and how Corona is uh, admonishing us to move forward as a field? Anybody want to respond to that? I'll start. Uh, I think right now it's still so early that nobody knows what fall is going to look like. Every time I see somebody come on saying fall is going to be this and we're going to do this, we, we don't know that. So I think in terms of the, of the quote, you know, in my job in enrollment management and as a chancellor, talking about online courses and uh, for those of you who are professors, I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive, but tried to get a class to go online for somebody who won't put their syllabus online, right? Thank you. Thanks and so then much. overnight, we woke up in the morning and it was like, everybody's got to be online for the rest of the semester. And all I could think of was all my years in yeah. enrollment management and as a, an administrator, 
trying to get more online offerings, right? So this is a change um, that was so fast. Uh, people's attention about whether an institution is going to make it or not. The other piece of this that I think is going to be really critical, um, and we've we've eaten around the edges. I still think first generation low income stuff, uh, traditionally minoritized communities. Still, we talk a better game, but we have not made as much progress. That's right. Uh, in in all of that larger community. And I'm afraid this is going to unequally impact uh, the, the, the programs and projects that do have momentum because it's going to be those minoritized groups that are going to feel this at home more, um, in families, you know, for families that are first geners that people want to know why they went to school to begin with. Now it's like, why are you going to go to school when we, none of us have jobs? That's right. So I think, I think that, um, it's hard in a moment to think about the upside down turn, but I don't think anybody on this panel would uh, disagree that we've needed some upside down turning for quite some time. So there are a couple of things that Sue said, and also I think that you mentioned the quote that makes me think about what I've been advising with, I've been spending the last two days on phone calls with provosts. We've been having these provosts working round tables. And I am amazed at how far removed people are from reality. So we ask a question to say, how many of you think we're gonna be back face-to-face -face fall in a traditional model, face-to-face um, -face in the fall in a traditional model? 85% of the provosts we've engaged with so far have said they believe that. It's the absolute most insane idea in my head because no matter what happens even if we have some sort of face to face in the fall it will not look like we turn on a light switch and went back to march first so i think that's the first thing i think the other thing is that we've known for a very long time that our business model in higher education was going to change everyone wanted to wait for it to happen to them and now COVID has accelerated that change and so a lot of the things that we're seeing we're doing now we knew we were going to have to do anyway because in 2025 we're going to have fewer 18 year olds than we've ever had in the history of this country and it's going to impact different regions very differently and so some of the ways we're thinking about, so you said, the quote says that we've changed the way we learned overnight. We have not changed the way we've learned. We changed the context in which we learn. Students still learn the same way. They still need the same supports. It is just a different context in which we are required and responsible to deliver that to them. I think that's something that's very important for us to all think about and be serious almost we think about our business and the way we engage students in higher education. I would say the, the other point that Sue made around dragging faculty on this, I spent about 70% of my time at the firm I'm fighting full-time faculty. And to be quite honest, fighting full-time faculty around these issues that now COVID has made a requirement for us in terms of acting. Now we are forced to act in ways that we've been saying we need to do, and to the point about rhetoric, giving a lot of rhetoric about what we do for students, but not actually performing those tasks, now we're forced to. And I think, I hope Eric is gonna mention this, but we are already predicting, based on what we're learning from students and their families, a 20% decrease in students going off to college in the fall. And that's just at our best guess with what we know right now. Mm. Our business model is upended forever. There are some institutions that may not be able to survive from this and other institutions that will simply not look the same when we return in the fall. And people have to plan for that right now. And we have to manage expectations for students, their families, and our communities right now. And it's happening too slow, to be honest. I'm going to stop there and I'll let the folks go. If I can go ahead, chime Jerry. in to what mm -hmm. Kadish is saying. I sit on a board at the University of Akron, my alumni, uh, my, my alma mater. And as you guys know, it just came out in the news, uh, uh, what's gonna happen with that institution. We were in a call a week before that it was announced with the president to kind of talk through what that would look like. So they're consolidating 11 colleges down to five. Um, they're gonna already face a $70 million uh, shortfall um, from revenue generation overall, um, not only in this academic year, but they're also looking at basically next fiscal year, 2021. 20, on top of that, athletics, since they're not a, a big time athletic school, pretty much is gonna be put on hold. Um, and also just having to downsize that athletic budget, which depends on playing big games against bigger schools. Um, and they, like Kadisha had just mentioned, uh, are looking at a 20% decrease in enrollment just for the fall and spring of next year automatically. Uh, part of their issues is, of course, over the years, they grew faster than they could, capacity wise. And they did have some, about eight years ago, issues with finances where they had to readjust, but this will also impact layoffs. Uh, last night, talk furloughs. This is just straight layoffs, reorganization of people, all the other great stuff. 
for an institution that I graduated from. And so that has made the news that you can see. And so as Kadish has mentioned, you're going to see it across the board where some institutions will not survive this. Wow, so, this is wow. Wow. Another, another, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. Go ahead. Another area that we're going to see, I, I definitely agree with everyone's points. But one other aspect that is overlooked um, that I am sensitive to because I was, I am an instructional designer. And this was my, that was my battle. One of the biggest issues, and it's some, and this is what my PhD is actually in, is that what is happening right now is not online instruction. It is not, it is, it's what we are calling it in our field is emergency remote teaching. Yeah, we're calling it ERI. <laughs> We've named it emergency remote a, instruction. That's, that's exactly point. right. That's actually, that's actually going to be, right. so I, 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 yes, we definitely are going to have to change the way we're doing things. The number one concern that I have from where I sit is that because of the fact that these faculty um, for better or for work just weren't prepared to make this transition and because this transition was done so quickly, the concern now is um, I, I was already dealing with a lot of people resistant to doing an online master's degree, an online PhD because they said, oh, I can't learn that way. And it has always that was my battle as an instructional designer working with the faculty and it i can't teach that way and it was always a pedagogical issue it was very rarely a modality issue it was mostly pedagogical they just didn't understand what it took to be a teacher and honestly it's almost an insult to someone in the field who actually does teach online to think that you could i could not take my online class and be told you can't teach us online, you gotta teach face-to-face. -face. I couldn't make that my online class a face-to-face -face class in four days. So why did they think that someone could take a face-to-face -face class and put it online? And, and I understand we had to do it, but then the, the issue that I'm seeing is gonna be there's a whole lot of students who have been uh, disenfranchised, have had bad experiences because it was a pedagogical issue. And then what's gonna happen now is that uh, Kadish is talking about a 20% decline. Part of that decline, I think, is because people just went through an awful learning experience. So now they're like, no, 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 I'm not doing this again. Whereas I, I don't hear the universities really sitting down and coming out at the university level and saying, hey, we had to do this because we we're trying to flatten the curve. But here's what, edu here's what our instruction is going to look like in the, in the future. Here are all the workshops we're doing. Um, we're not seeing uh, a PR campaign about, hey, we have provided workshops for all the faculty to better prepare them to teach online. We're not seeing that from any institutions, and that's actually what needs to happen. It's less about, um, th that's where the issue is going to be, because I, I don't want to have a situation where people think that what this is, is, oh, so this is what online is. I, I got into a discussion with someone who was teaching a face-to-face -face three hour graduate school class and decided that they were going to go online and convert their three hour lectures into three hours worth of videos. And I said, I have three master's degrees and I literally have a PhD in online education and I have yet to watch a single, in my master's programs, in my doctoral program, I never once watched a single video produced by my teacher. And I was literally taught how to teach online and I never did that. Um, so it's just interesting that that's, the, that's where people went. And I think that actually made things worse. Okay, Rob, this is really I, good. I, I, I got to jump on Rob's point, though, about the quality question. Because the quality piece is going to be a huge differentiator in the fall, particularly for schools who want to make a value proposition switch to why should you come to our institution if we're all in our living rooms? When we have delivered to you, we promise you this high in touch, high in person experience, which we can no longer deliver. I said the other thing, going back to the idea about the three hour video for the course, I talk to faculty all the time and I ask them this How many of you have watched the, a full length Star Wars video at your house without getting up? Well, that'd be zero. Well, I said faculty members, not you, Eric. <laughs> I watched it too. What I'm saying, the, but the point I'm making is we have this idea about TLDR for students. We forget if you send a bunch of faculty members a seven paragraph email with no bullet points, they aren't going to read it. And they certainly are going to watch a three hour video. The idea that that's high quality instruction for people who say they're great teachers is insane. So the point that Rob is making is really important and well taken. And what I said was the way people learn has not changed. People's face-to-face -face classes and their little fiefdoms has covered over the fact they don't know how to teach. 
And we're now uncovering that in this space. I'm gonna go off, my, I'll get off my soapbox again, but I had to respond to that.